If you've ever traveled from Clarksburg to Buchanan on West Virginia Route 20, you've passed through the unassuming town of Quietdale, West Virginia. It might come to some surprise to you that this town was connected to one of the most infamous crimes in West Virginia history and one of its first serial killers. Today, we're going to talk about Harry Powers, the Bluebeard of Quietdale. What's up ladies and gentlemen, I'm the best Virginian. I cover West Virginia history and travel videos, sometimes delve into the paranormal, and like in today's instance, uh, occasionally cover true crime stories from across the mountain state of West Virginia. If those are things that interest you, you might want to hit that subscribe button because it's pretty much all that we do here. Today we're going to talk about one of West Virginia's first and most infamous serial killers and oddly enough uh, we're going to go into how his life and crimes kind of flowed over into aspects of pop culture. Like by the time we get done with this episode we're going to have to talk about Spike Lee. That's so our story allegedly begins in the Netherlands in 1893. That was when one Harm Dreth, um, the man who would eventually become known as Harry Powers, was born. I'm going to be saying allegedly a lot in this video because on top of being a murderer, uh, Powers was a habitual liar and during his lifetime would come up with multiple backstories and aliases in order to swindle money from wealthy widows. At some point, Dreth, who I'm just going to refer to from now on as Harry Powers for the sake of simplicity, uh, migrated to the United States and set up home in Quietdale, West Virginia, a small town outside of Clarksburg, West Virginia, in Harrison County, where he would eventually get married and begin life as a grocery store owner, uh, vacuum salesman, and used furniture salesman, allegedly. Um, we do know that he actually did own a grocery store, but those other two, not content with the simple life or maybe feeling the struggle of the Great Depression, at some point Power started using Lonely Hearts ads to get in contact with women, uh, mostly wealthy widows. In case you're wondering what a Lonely Heart ad was, it was an ad that was placed in uh, magazines pretty much like the Craigslist before Craigslist. Like, before Craigslist, this was the way you would go about meeting new and interesting people uh, who would probably end up murdering you. Now, it's believed that Powers uh, would get into contact with these women, go to visit them, convince them to give him enough money so that he could go back to West Virginia and get things ready for them to move in, at which point he would just run and take the money with him. Now, Powers' ads in these magazines uh, said, quote, Wealthy widower worth $150,000 has income from four hundred to 2000 a month. So for you know recent widows who were trying to take care of children, this was a pretty good deal. In fact, this ad caught the attention of one Asta Escher, a Chicago widow and mother of three who began writing and befriended Powers who at that point was going by the alias Cornelius O. Pearson. And he had like four or five different aliases that he was also going by because he was at this point also in contact with several other widows. Uh, shortly after this, Powers would go to Chicago, uh, would move in with the Eshers, and then sometime shortly after that, they would disappear. Before they disappeared though, Asta had evicted uh, one of the tenants. She had rented out rooms to individuals and she had evicted one of the tenants because she had said that Powers was going to help her sell the house uh, so that she could relocate with him to West Virginia. A few months later, one of these tenants would return. Apparently he had left some tools or something at the house. Uh, he realized the family wasn't there. The only person there was Powers, who was still going by Cornelius, and he was moving a lot of the furniture out of the house, basically gutting and emptying out the house. Something about the story Powers gave to this former tenant really didn't add up, so this individual uh, notified the local police. Quickly, the police showed up, uh, questioned Powers about the whereabouts of the family, and his story really didn't add up. 
powers claim to be the owner of the Fairmont Hotel in nearby Fairmont, West Virginia, basically told police that the family had relocated west, but then they asked him why he hadn't gone with them west or why he was still living in West Virginia if he had gone with them west. His story didn't add up, so police really began uh, looking into the claims, really looking into this individual, Cornelius O. Pearson. And what they found out was there was no one in Fairmont with this name. In fact, there was really no one in North Central West Virginia with this name. Just when police started to think the trail was starting to run cold and they started having their doubts about finding this family, uh, they found a letter with a return address to a farm in Quietdale, a farm that was owned by one Harry Powers. Local police began uh, questioning Powers, who insisted he, the Eshers had traveled out west, but then he kind of let something slip and said that Asta had followed him to West Virginia a few months earlier. With this, the police began uh, searching the property, and one of their key points of interest was a recently built garage where they found several belongings uh, of Asta's. The next day, the police began excavating what they thought was a recently dug ditch behind the garage, and this was when they discovered five bodies. Uh, Asta and her three children, along with an other woman, a divorcee from Massachusetts named Dorothy Lemke. Now, once they had found these bodies, they were able to place uh, Harry Powers under arrest. At this point, several people from the community actually came out. It kind of became this big spectacle, and the police began searching the Powers residence. This is where they found a trunk uh, with hundreds of letters to and from women from across the country. It's believed that Powers had been running this con ring for nearly a decade with many different aliases. While police were able to find the five initial victims, Powers would later say he couldn't remember how many he had actually murdered. Now, while under arrest awaiting trial, uh, Powers would admit to the murders, and whenever they would bring him a confession to sign, he refused because it could have implicated his wife and sister in some of his crimes. Uh, when police agreed to remove their names from the confession, he would sign it. And he also expressed concern uh, because of how heavily pu publicized uh, his crimes was that he wouldn't be able to get a fair trial in Harrison County. And again, uh, the national newspapers really reigned with this story. The Powers residence quickly uh, was renamed the murder form and in one of those weird kind of historical coincidences, Powers was concerned that his trial would turn into a spectacle. Um, because the Harrison County Courthouse at this time period was undergoing renovations, they actually had to move the trial to the nearby Clarksburg Opera House. So in a way, yeah, it was absolutely turned into a spectacle because more than 1,200 people packed the Opera House to see this trial. The first day of the trial was basically uh, the state bringing forth evidence, talking about their discoveries uh, on the farm, just presenting evidence against Mr. Powers, who during the trial basically didn't care. At one point, a couple people reported he was actually like nodding off, like trying to take a nap. Tensions were so high and people of Harrison County were so angry after they learned about Powers' crimes that they actually had to relocate Powers from the Clarksburg City Jail to the Harrison County Jail. And there was still a mob that formed outside and tried breaking into the jail to murder powers. The next day, um, unlike the first day where he really couldn't care about his trial, 
he proclaimed his innocence, uh, swore his wife, and his miserable marriage drove him into the arms of other women. He claimed that he had only signed the confession after police had brutally beaten him, and again, citing the uh, mob forming outside the Harrison County Jail, claimed that he could not get a fair trial in Harrison County, but it took the jury uh, less than two hours to find Powers guilty, and he was sentenced to execution by hanging. While at the West Virginia State Penitentiary, Powers would produce a detailed confession of his crimes, and he would also become a massive opponent for the death penalty, uh, against the death penalty. So, even once he was found guilty, he was still trying to get out of uh, being hung. In one account I was able to find, uh, within a couple days of his execution, he was asked uh, how many other victims there were and where their bodies were located, to which he just responded, uh, you got me on five, what would another 50 do? Powers was hung on March 18th, 1932, when asked if he had any last words, he simply responded with no, which I find that fascinating for an individual who had used his tongue his entire life to con women, to you know convince women to come back to his farm with him so he could murder them, to try and you know, weasel his way out of a trial, to try and condemn the death penalty when it came to the end of his story, he really had nothing to add to it. He really had nothing to say. And you might be thinking that that's the end of the story of Harry Powers, but it's actually not. Uh, local author Davis Grubb, he was a Moundsville native, uh, would be inspired to base an antagonist for his book, The Night of the Hunter, after Harry Powers. The book would later be turned into a movie that many today regard as a thriller classic. There is a scene in the movie where the antagonist does a monologue about um, he has love and hate tattooed on his knuckles and he s talks about how that is basically the story of man, this constant struggle between good and evil, love and hate. This scene is actually referenced in the Spike Lee movie, Do the Right Thing. One other little note I should add is after his trial where he said that basically he had been driven to uh, the arms of other women by his wife and his miserable marriage, his wife did not claim his body after he was executed, which means you can visit the grave of Harry Powers today at the White Gate Cemetery outside Moundsville, West Virginia. Until next time, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I like to do these true crime videos from time to time. If they are something you like and appreciate, let me know down below. Leave a like, leave a comment. If you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button. And sharing these videos always helps the channel grow. But until next time, stay wild, stay wonderful, and I'll talk to you later.